Uh, the miracles attributed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are an integral part of Islamic tradition and are recorded in various sources, primarily in the Hadith literature and biographical works about the Prophet's life. These miracles are seen as signs of his prophethood and divine favor, illustrating his connection with Allah and his role as the final messenger. 1. The Quran, the greatest miracle of Prophet Muhammad, is considered to be the Quran itself. It is believed to be the literal word of God as revealed to him over a period of 23 years through the angel Gabriel, Jibril in Arabic. The linguistic and literary excellence of the Quran, its timeless guidance, and its preservation over centuries, despite various attempts to distort or discredit it, are viewed as miraculous. 2. Splitting of the moon, one of the most well-known miracles attributed to Prophet Muhammad, is the splitting of the moon. According to Islamic tradition, when the Quraysh tribe of Mecca demanded a miracle from him as proof of his prophethood, he pointed to the moon and by the power of God it split into two distinct parts, then rejoined. This event is mentioned in the Quran 54 verse 1 to 2 and is also recorded in various hadith collections. 3. The Night Journey, Isra and Mirage uh, This miraculous journey is said to have occurred when the Prophet was transported from Mecca to Jerusalem and then ascended through the heavens, encountering various prophets along the way, until he reached the presence of Allah. This journey is mentioned briefly in the Quran, 17.1, and is elaborated upon in Hadith literature. 4. Water springing from fingers. During a time of scarcity, it is reported that the Prophet was able to produce water by placing his fingers in a vessel and water gushed forth, providing for the needs of his companions. This miracle is recorded in various hadith collections. Number 5. Miraculous Healing Prophet Muhammad is said to have performed numerous miraculous healings throughout his life, curing the sick and injured by the power of Allah. These instances are documented in hadith literature and include cases of blindness, leprosy, and other ailments. 6. Food Multiplication On several occasions, the Prophet is reported to have multiplied small amounts of food to feed large gatherings of people. One well-known incident is the feeding of a large group of companions with just a few handfuls of food, which was miraculously multiplied to satisfy everyone present. 7. Foretelling the Future Prophet Muhammad is said to have foretold numerous future events with remarkable accuracy. These prophecies cover a wide range of topics, including the spread of Islam, the conquest of various lands, and the signs of the Day of Judgment. These miracles, among others, are recounted in Islamic tradition and serve to reinforce the faith of believers in the prophethood of Muhammad and the truth of Islam. They are seen as manifestations of God's power and mercy, affirming the validity of the message delivered by his final messenger. The Quran itself is considered the greatest miracle of Prophet Muhammad, and its linguistic, literary, and spiritual aspects are often cited as evidence of its divine origin. However, within the Quran, there are also specific instances where miraculous events are described. Here are a few examples. 1. Splitting of the Sea, Surah Ash-Shu'ara 2663-66. The story of Prophet Moses Musa and the parting of the sea is recounted in the Quran. When Moses and the Israelites were pursued by Pharaoh and his army, God commanded Moses to strike the sea with his staff. As a result, the sea miraculously parted, allowing Moses and his followers to cross safely, while drowning Pharaoh and his army when the sea closed back up. The Miracle of Birth, Surah Maryam, 1922-26 The Quran describes the miraculous birth of Prophet Jesus, Isa, who was born to the Virgin Mary, Maryam, without a father. This miraculous conception is portrayed as a sign of God's power and sovereignty over the laws of nature. 3. The Talking Infant, Surah al Maryam, 1919-27-33 Following the birth of Jesus, Mary returned to her people carrying the infant. When they accused her of unchastity due to her unexpected pregnancy, Jesus, as an infant, miraculously spoke from the cradle, testifying to his prophethood and the purity of his mother. 4. The Preservation of the Body of Pharaoh, Surah Yunus, 10, In this passage, the Quran describes how God preserved the body of Pharaoh, who had drowned in pursuit of Moses and the Israelites, as a sign for future generations. Pharaoh's body was saved from decomposition to serve as a warning and a lesson. 
Five, The Miracle of the She-Camel, Sir El Kamar 54, 27 to 31. The story of the She-Camel, sent as a sign to the people of Tamud, is mentioned in the Quran. Prophet Saleh was sent to the Tamud people, and as a sign of his prophethood, a pregnant she-camel was miraculously produced from a rock. Despite warnings not to harm the camel, they eventually killed it, leading to their punishment. These are just a few examples of the miraculous events mentioned in the Quran. Each miracle serves as a demonstration of God's power, his ability to control and transcend the natural order, and his support of his messengers. They are meant to inspire faith in the hearts of believers and to convey important lessons about the consequences of disbelief and the rewards of faithfulness. The phrases Lord of the East and Lord of the West are mentioned in the Quran in several verses. They refer to attributes of Allah, the Supreme Being in Islam. Here's an explanation of their meanings. 1. Lord of the East Rab al-Mashriq. This phrase refers to Allah's dominion and sovereignty over the eastern part of the world. It signifies his control, authority, and power over all that exists in the eastern direction. It encompasses ev everything from the rising of the sun in the east to all the lands, peoples, and phenomena that occur in that direction. It symbolizes Allah's omniscience and omnipotence, highlighting his role as the creator and sustainer of the universe. Lord of the West, Rabba Maghrib, Similar to Lord of the East, this phrase denotes uh, Allah's supremacy over the western part of the world. It signifies his absolute authority and control over everything in the western direction, including the setting of the sun in the west and all that lies beyond it. Just as with the east, it encompasses all lands, peoples, and events occurring in the west. It emphasizes Allah's transcendence beyond space and time, as well as his role as the ultimate source of guidance, mercy, and justice for all creation. These titles are used in the Quran to underscore Allah's all-encompassing sovereignty and to remind believers of his supreme power and authority over the entire universe, irrespective of direction or location. They serve as a reminder of the need for humility, submission, and obedience to the Creator, who governs all aspects of existence, from the east to the west. The practice of sending blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, known as Salat al-Nabi or Salawat, is deeply rooted in Islamic tradition and is considered a virtuous act of worship. The phrase, Allah and his angels send blessings upon Muhammad, is mentioned in the Quran, specifically in Surah Al-Ahzab 3356. Here's an explanation of why Allah and his angels send blessings unto Muhammad. 1. Divine Command The Quran commands believers to send blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad. The verse in Surah Al-Ahzab 33.56 states, Indeed, Allah and his angels confer blessing upon the Prophet. O you who have believed, ask Allah to confer blessing upon him and ask Allah to grant him peace. This verse establishes sending blessings upon the Prophet as a form of worship and obedience to Allah's command. 2. Exemplary Character Prophet Muhammad is revered as the best example for humanity. He embodied the highest moral and ethical standards, displaying qualities of kindness, compassion, justice, and humility. Sending blessings upon him is a way for believers to express gratitude for his guidance and to honor his exemplary character. 3. Intercession Believers believe in the concept of intercession, where the Prophet Muhammad will intercede on behalf of his followers on the Day of Judgment. Sending blessings upon him is seen as a means to seek his intercession and to gain closeness to Allah through his blessed status. 4. Love and Respect Muslims hold deep love and respect for Prophet Muhammad as the final messenger of Allah. Sending blessings upon him is a way to express this love and reverence. It is a means for believers to remember him fondly and to honor his pivotal role in conveying the message of Islam. 5. Spiritual Benefit Sending blessings upon the Prophet is believed to have spiritual benefits for the individual who engages in this practice. It is seen as a means of drawing closer to Allah, increasing one's faith, and seeking purification of the heart. In summary, the act of sending blessings upon Prophet Muhammad is a fundamental aspect of Islamic faith and devotion. It is rooted in divine command, reverence for the Prophet's character, belief in intercession, love and respect for him, 
and the spiritual benefits it provides to believers. The phrase, the sun sets in the muddy pool, is an example of figurative language known as hyperbole, specifically metaphor. It is not meant to be taken literally, but ra rather as, as a vivid and exaggerated description to emphasize a point or convey a certain meaning. In this case, the phrase is often used to describe someone's inaccurate or ignorant understanding of a situation or phenomenon. In its literal interpretation, the phrase suggests an impossibility, as the sun does not actually set in a muddy pool. Instead, it descends below the horizon due to the rotation of the earth. However, when used metaphorically, it implies that the individual's perception or understanding is flawed, misguided, or based on falsehood. For example, if someone makes a statement that is factually incorrect or demonstrates a lack of understanding about a topic, another person might use the phrase, the sun sets in the muddy pool. To illustrate that their assertion is as absurd and unfounded as claiming that the sun sets in a muddy pool, it highlights the discrepancy between reality and the person's mistaken belief or assertion. Overall, the phrase serves as a colorful and exaggerated way to emphasize the idea of ignorance or error in understanding, making it a powerful tool in communication and rhetoric. The Fatiha, also known as Surah Al-Fatiha, is considered the fundamental prayer in Islam for several reasons. One, position in the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha is the opening chapter of the Quran, which holds a central and revered position in Islam. It is recited in every unit of the Islamic ritual prayer, Salah, and is therefore an integral part of daily worship for Muslims. Its prominence as the opening chapter of the Quran emphasizes its importance and significance in Islamic practice. 2. Essential Themes Surah Al-Fatiha encapsulates essential themes of Islamic theology, belief, and supplication. It begins with praise and glorification of Allah, affirming His attributes of mercy and sovereignty. It then seeks guidance and direction from Allah, acknowledging human dependence on Him for guidance and assistance. Um, the Surah also emphasizes the importance of sincerity and steadfastness in faith, as well as the concept of divine judgment and accountability. 3. Comprehensive Supplication Surah Al-Fatiha serves as a comprehensive supplication dua that covers various aspects of spiritual, moral, and material needs. It is a prayer for guidance, forgiveness, mercy, and protection from misguidance and evil. Its concise yet profound verses express the core beliefs and values of Islam, making it a comprehensive expression of devotion and submission to Allah. 4. Connection with Allah By reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in every unit of Salah, Muslims establish a direct and intimate connection with Allah. The surah serves as a means of communication between the worshiper and their creator, allowing them to express their praise, gratitude, and petitions to Allah. This regular recitation reinforces the spiritual bond between the individual and Allah and serves as a reminder of their ultimate purpose and duty in life. 5. Community and Unity Surah Al-Fatiha is recited collectively in congregational prayers, emphasizing the sense of community and unity among Muslims. Regardless of language, ethnicity, or nationality, Muslims from diverse backgrounds recite Surah Al-Fatiha together in their prayers, uh, symbolizing their shared faith and devotion to Allah. This communal recitation fosters a sense of belonging and solidarity among believers, transcending differences, and promoting unity within the Muslim community. In summary, Surah Al-Fatiha holds a central and fundamental position in Islam due to its status as the opening chapter of the Quran, its essential themes of belief and supplication, its role as a comprehensive prayer, uh, its function as a means of connection with Allah, and its significance in fostering community and unity among Muslims. The verse you're referring to is known as Ayat Al-Kursi, which is the 255th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah in the Quran. It is one of the most well-known and revered verses in Islam. Here's an explanation of this verse. Allah, there is no deity except Him, the ever-living, the sustainer of all existence. Neither drowsiness overtakes Him nor sleep. To Him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with Him except by His permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them, and they encompass not a thing of His knowledge except for what He wills. 
His cursey extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation tires him not. And he is the most high, the most great. Quran 2, 255. This verse contains several profound theological concepts and attributes of Allah. 1. Monotheism, Tawheed. The verse begins by affirming the oneness of Allah and negating the existence of any deity besides him. It asserts that Allah is the only true God, worthy of worship and obedience. 2. Divine Attributes The verse describes Allah as the ever-living, al hay and the sustainer of all existence, al qayyum These attributes emphasize Allah's eternal existence and his role as the sustainer and maintainer of the entire universe. 3. Transcendence the verse highlights Allah's transcendence beyond human limitations. It states that neither drowsiness nor sleep overtakes him, indicating his absolute power and sovereignty. Unlike human beings, Allah does not experience fatigue or weakness. 4. Omniscience. The verse asserts Allah's comprehensive knowledge of all things. It states that Allah knows everything that is present, past, and future. His knowledge is not limited by time or space, and he is aware of all that occurs in the universe. Number 5. Intercession. The verse addresses the concept of intercession, stating that no one can intercede with Allah except by his permission. This emphasizes Allah's ultimate authority and judgment, and that intercession is only granted by his will. 6. Supremacy and Greatness. The verse concludes by asserting Allah's supremacy and greatness. His cursey throne extends over the heavens and the earth, symbolizing his dominion and sovereignty over all creation. Despite his vast authority, the preservation of the heavens and the earth does not burden or tire him. He is described as the most high and the most great, signifying his unmatched status and majesty. Overall, Ayat al-Kursi is a profound declaration of monotheism, divine attributes, and the limitless power and knowledge of Allah. It serves as a reminder of His majesty, sovereignty, and mercy, inspiring believers to worship Him and trust in His wisdom and guidance. Isaiah 45, 5 in the Bible and Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah 112 in the Quran, both express the concept of monotheism and the uniqueness of God, albeit in different contexts and languages. Let's examine each verse and their similarities. 1. Isaiah 45, 5 I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. Uh, this verse from the book of Isaiah emphasizes the oneness of God and the exclusive worship due to Him alone. It asserts that there is no other deity besides the Lord, and He alone deserves obedience, reverence, and worship. The verse also highlights God's sovereignty and his ability to strengthen and support his servants. 2. Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah 1 and 12 Say, He is Allah, who is one, Allah, the eternal refuge. He neither begets nor is born, nor is there to him any equivalent. Surah Al-Ikhlas is a short chapter in the Quran that succinctly affirms the oneness of Allah and refutes any notion of plurality or equivalence with him. It emphasizes that Allah is uniquely one, eternal, and incomparable. The surah rejects the concept of begetting or being begotten, asserting Allah's absolute transcendence beyond human attributes or relationships. While both verses affirm monotheism and the uniqueness of God, there are differences in their emphasis and context. Isaiah 45.5 is part of a broader prophecy addressing the Israelites and the geopolitical context of the time. It emphasizes God's sovereignty and his relationship with his chosen people. Surah al-Ikhlas, on the other hand, is a direct declaration of monotheism within the context of Islamic revelation. It serves as a fundamental statement of faith for Muslims, encapsulating the core belief in the oneness of Allah without any partners or equals. In summary, both Isaiah 45, verse 5 and Surah Al-Ikhlas affirm the central tenet of monotheism and, and the exclusive worship of God. They emphasize the uniqueness, transcendence, and sovereignty of the divine, serving as foundational statements of faith in their respective religious traditions. John 17, verse 3 in the Bible and the Shahada, Declaration of Faith in Islam, both express the concept of monotheism and the acknowledgement of God's oneness, albeit within different religious contexts and languages. Let's examine each statement and their similarities. 1. John 17, 3, NIV. Now this is eternal life, 
that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In this verse from the Gospel of John, Jesus is portrayed as praying to God the Father. He acknowledges God as the only true deity and emphasizes the importance of knowing God for attaining eternal life. The verse affirms monotheism and underscores the uniqueness of God as the sole object of worship and salvation. 2. Shahada Declaration of Faith La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah the Shahada is the declaration of faith in Islam, recited by Muslims as a testament to their belief in the oneness of God and the prophethood of Muhammad. It translates to, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This declaration affirms monotheism by negating the existence of any deity besides Allah and affirming Allah as the only true God. It also acknowledges Muhammad as the final messenger sent by Allah to convey his message to humanity. While John 17.3 and the Shahada express similar themes of monotheism and the acknowledgement of God's oneness, there are differences in their emphasis and context due to the distinct theological frameworks of Christianity and Islam. John 17.3 is situated within the Christian belief system, where Jesus is recognized as the Son of God and a central figure in Christian theology. The verse highlights the role of Jesus as a mediator between humanity and God, emphasizing the importance of knowing God and Jesus Christ for salvation. On the other hand, the Shahada is a foundational statement of faith in Islam, emphasizing the absolute oneness of God and the finality of Muhammad's prophethood. It serves as the core declaration of belief for Muslims, encapsulating the essence of Islamic monotheism and the authority of Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. In summary, both John 17.3 and the Shahada affirm the concept of monotheism and the acknowledgement of God's oneness, albeit within the distinct theological frameworks of Christianity and Islam. They serve as foundational statements of faith for their respective religious communities, emphasizing the centrality of God in the lives of believers and the importance of recognizing his sovereignty and guidance. John 20, 17 in the Bible and Surah Al-Imran, Surah 3, verse 55 in the Quran, both involve statements attributed to Jesus, i.e., albeit in different religious contexts and narratives. Let's examine each verse and their relationship. 1 John 20, verse 17, NIV, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God. And your God. In this verse from the Gospel of John, after his resurrection, Jesus instructs Mary Magdalene not to hold on to him because he has not yet ascended to the Father. He then commissions her to go and inform his disciples that he is ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This statement underscores the relationship between Jesus and God the Father, emphasizing their distinct roles and Jesus' acknowledgement of God as his deity. 2 Surah Al-Imran, Surah 3, verse 55. When Allah said, O Jesus, indeed I will take you and raise you to myself and purify you from those who disbelieve and make those who follow you in submission to Allah alone, superior to those who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. Then to me is your return, and I will judge between you concerning that in which you used to differ. This verse from the Quran is part of a dialogue between Allah and Jesus. Allah informs Jesus that he will raise him to himself and purify him from those who disbelieve. Allah also promises to make those who follow Jesus in submission to Allah alone superior to those who disbelieve until the day of resurrection. The verse concludes with a reminder that everyone will eventually return to Allah who will judge between them regarding their differences. While John 20.17 and Surah Al-Imran 3.55 both involve statements attributed to Jesus, they reflect different theological perspectives and narratives within Christianity and Islam, respectively. In John 20, 17, Jesus acknowledges God as his Father and his God, indicating a hierarchical relationship between himself and God the Father within the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. In Surah Al-Imran 3.55, Allah addresses Jesus and informs him of his destiny, emphasizing his exaltation and purification from disbelief. This verse reflects the Islamic understanding of Jesus as a prophet and messenger of Allah, rather than the divine Son of God. In summary, while both verses involve statements attributed to Jesus, 
They express distinct theological concepts and narratives within Christianity and Islam. The compilation of the Quran is a fascinating aspect of Islamic history, involving meticulous efforts to preserve the revelations received by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Here's an overview of how the Quran was compiled. 1. Oral transmission during the Prophet's lifetime. The revelations of the Quran were first conveyed orally by Prophet Muhammad to his companions over a period of approximately 23 years, starting from around 610 CE until his passing in 632 CE. The Prophet would recite the verses he received from Allah to his followers, who would then memorize and write them down on various materials such as parchment, palm leaves, and pieces of bone or leather. Memorization by Companions Many of the Prophet's companions, Sahaba, had memorized the Quran in its entirety during his lifetime. They would recite it regularly in prayers and gatherings, ensuring its preservation through oral transmission. Compilation during Caliphate of Abu Bakr After the death of Prophet Muhammad, there were several wars known as the Ridda Wars, wars of apostasy, during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, the first successor of the Prophet. Many of the memorizers of the Quran died in these wars, prompting the concern that parts of the Qur'an might be lost if not compiled. At the suggestion of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abu Bakr tasked Zayd ibn Thabit, a scribe and one of the Prophet's companions, with compiling the Qur'an into a single manuscript. Zayd collected the written fragments of the Qur'an from various sources, verified their authenticity through witness testimonies, and compiled them into a single volume. 4. Standardization under Uthman ibn Affan during the Caliphate of Uthman ibn Affan, the third successor of the Prophet, Islam expanded rapidly and variations in recitation began to emerge in different regions. To maintain uniformity and prevent potential disputes, Uthman commissioned a committee led by Zayd ibn Thabit to produce multiple copies of the Quran based on the compilation made during Abu Bakr's time. These copies were then sent to different regions of the Islamic Empire and all other existing copies were ordered to be destroyed to ensure uniformity in recitation. 5. Oral Tradition and Written Copies Despite the compilation and standardization efforts, the oral tradition of memorization and recitation remained integral to the preservation of the Quran. Throughout Islamic history, scholars and scribes continued to produce written copies of the Quran and the oral transmission of the text from teacher to student remained a vital means of preserving its authenticity. Overall, the compilation of the Quran involved both oral transmission and written documentation, with efforts made by early Muslim leaders to ensure its preservation and uniformity. Today, the Quran is recited and memorized by millions of Muslims worldwide, maintaining the tradition of preservation established by the Prophet and his companions. The compilation of hadiths, the sayings and actions of Prophet Muhammad, involved meticulous efforts by early Muslim scholars to preserve and authenticate his teachings. Here's an overview of how hadiths were compiled. 1. 1. Oral transmission during the Prophet's lifetime. During the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his companions closely observed his words and actions and transmitted them orally to subsequent generations. They would memorize the hadiths and pass them down orally to ensure their preservation. 2. Early documentation by companions. Some of the Prophet's companions, particularly those known as hadith narrators or transmitters, began to document his sayings and actions during his lifetime. They would write down hadiths on various materials, such as parchment, palm leaves, and pieces of bone or leather. Notable companions known for documenting hadiths include Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Aisha, and Anas ibn Malik. Compilation efforts during the caliphates. After the passing of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the early Muslim community faced various challenges, including wars, political disputes, and the need for religious guidance. The first three caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Khattab, and Uthman ibn Affan, played key roles in collecting and preserving hadiths. Abu Bakr. During his caliphate, Abu Bakr encouraged the companions to document the hadiths they had heard directly from the Prophet. Some companions, such as Abu Huraira, compiled collections of hadiths during this time. 
Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Khattab continued the efforts initiated by Abu Bakr and encouraged the companions to compile hadiths. He appointed scholars like Abu Huraira and Abdullah ibn Abbas to teach and transmit hadiths. Uthman ibn Affan, Uthman ibn Affan undertook the task of standardizing the Quran, but he also played a role in hadith compilation. He ordered the collection of hadiths and sent them to different regions of the Islamic empire. 4. Systematic compilation by scholars. As Islam spread, the need for a systematic compilation of hadiths became more apparent. Various scholars emerged to undertake this task, employing rigorous methods to authenticate and classify hadiths based on their reliability and chains of transmission, isnad. Among the early scholars known for their compilation efforts are Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj, Imam Abu Dawood, Imam at-Tirmidhi, Imam al-Nasai, and Imam ibn Majah. Each scholar developed their own collection of hadiths, known as a hadith compilation or hadith book, which became renowned for their authenticity and reliability. Number five. Critical analysis and classification. Scholars developed stringent criteria for evaluating the authenticity of hadiths, focusing on the reliability of the narrators, the consistency of the chains of transmission, and the content of the hadith itself. Hadiths were classified into categories based on their content and level of authenticity, such as sahih, authentic, hasan, good, and daif, weak. Number six, transmission and commentary. Compiled hadith collections were transmitted orally and in written form across generations. Scholars would study and analyze hadiths providing commentary and explanations to ensure their proper understanding and application. Overall, the compilation of hadiths involved a comprehensive and rigorous process of preservation, authentication, and transmission carried out by early Muslim scholars to safeguard the teachings and practices of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for, for future generations. Today, these compiled collections serve as important sources of guidance and authority in Islamic jurisprudence and ethics.